Deep sky astrophotography is really a hobby for crazy, crazy, but absolutely amazing people. Hello there. <laughs> and uh, it, it comes with so many difficulties, single points of failures, potential for frustration, but also so much learning and rewards at the end of the road or even in the middle of the road because it's all about the journey. Now, one of the big obstacles that we have with astrophotography is the weather. And of course, when we talk about the weather, the first thing that comes to mind is clouds. Obviously, clouds will put a damper on any astrophotography session. They are horrible when they arrive at the middle of a session because they can then um, mess with your guiding. Your guide scope might think it's following a star when it's following clouds and it like drifts you off of target. And if you don't have an automated process in your uh, astrophotography sequence to recenter the target automatically, then you get into trouble. Okay, clouds, we all know, we all hate them. And uh, there are many ways to see what clouds will be in the sky for any given night. Uh, for me in Tokyo, one of the most reliable, reliable sites that I've seen is uh, Meteo Blue. Um, there's also Yahoo weather in, uh, in Japan is pretty good. Uh, but I know that there are many other choices for uh, people in Europe and the United States. And Nico Carver from Nebula Photos recently did a video on just that topic. And I'll put a link to that video down in the description. There's also another factor uh, that we often forget about and sometimes at the worst moment it is the the humidity of the air the relative humidity in the air and this is because our optics will cool down very quickly once they're exposed to the outside air and if they cool down enough the humidity in the air can condense on the optics which is also not great for astrophotography we have tons of ways of dealing with that such as like I have here a dew band uh, and you have some adjustable dew bands as well, etc, etc. It's all nice and good. And I think most astrophotographers are aware of that and have at some point in the past forgotten to bring their dew band or their dew shield while they were traveling to uh, a dark zone and, <laughs> and cursed their luck. That has absolutely happened to me because of course it has. However, for today, I'm going to focus on another factor which you might be hearing despite the wind muff on my uh, um, microphone right now, it is wind. And wind is absolutely horrible. Here in Tokyo, Tokyo is in the middle of the Tokyo Plains. It's an absolutely great shape to drive strong winds through Japan to the, mo to the mountains to the northwest. Awesome, which means, and because I am on a roof balcony, I am exposed to all of that wind ch being channeled here. So I very, very often get very strong wind. And today, tonight is also a night where there is fairly strong winds that are predicted. So I am expecting the guiding to be terrible. And what happened is actually I took pictures last night of the monkey head nebula, which is very close to the jellyfish nebula that I took in a previous video. And I used my AM5 mount, which I have here on loan for, from ZW for review purposes. And I found that the mount didn't do well at all in the wind. I got really poor guiding. Uh, let's have a look. Here we are on the PhD2 uh, guide log from last night. As, as you can see, we have periods there, especially in the, at the beginning of this night and also around 10 p.m. where the guiding gets uh, worse. On average, across the evening, it's a guiding of 1.22 arc seconds, which is not the end of the world. It's def and definitely fine for my uh, telescope focal lengths of 300 millimeters. But if uh, and if I look like at only a single guide area that had no wind, like here, and I select this only, we can see that the guiding was 0.61 arc seconds, which is perfectly good, no problem whatsoever. Uh, the issue comes when we look at the guiding period like this one, which is probably going to be a bit less convincing with 1.70 arc seconds. So that's actually like not as bad as I was expecting to see. Um, we can look at this period here as well, see, see what we see in there, 1.40 arc seconds overall. So again, not the end of the world, but if we, if we do zoom in, 
the spikes there are very significant like momentarily we have uh, plus minus 10 arc seconds there is no way that this, that is this is not going to be visible in the images the only reason why the rms for this period for instance is so good is simply because those spikes don't last for a long time we're able to recover quickly after the wind gust is over so let's see the results in our actual images so I'm looking at the image history of last night from Nina. And sorry about the pixelization. This is because I am on my remote uh, desktop. But if we look at those stars, we can immediately see that they're very oblong, right? Even at my focal length. Uh, some other subs that were affected in theory by wind, if I select them and load them in Nina, well, it's still oblong, but less so, right? So it's like, it does kind of get better. And I would say like the, the subs at around, let's say, 9.30 p.m. should be much better. So we can see the effects of the wind. And this is why uh, processes like here, yes, the stars are round, there is no problem whatsoever. So this is why like processes like the weighted batch pre-processing in PixInsight can be super useful, as well as the blink tool that's in PixInsight or the equivalent tool that is in, uh, in Siri Louise viewing a sequence. And this is definitely much less good than what my much beefier um, my main mount, the uh, SEM60 that I have from Ioptron, would have provided under such windy skies. But, you know, I don't mind because right now we're still very close to full moon. <laughs> so it's like my imaging is just for fun. Anyway, there are no stakes. Uh, so what I'm going to do tonight based on the uh, horrendous guiding results, well, not quite horrendous, but they had impact on my subframes as, as you were able to see, is instead of just like switching the uh, the telescope back to my SEM60 amount, I am going to try something a bit uh, different and a bit weird, which is simply lowering the uh, tripod to uh, be close to the ground. Because I'm on a roof balcony, I have those walls there. So if I have my equipment close to the ground and not in the rotor of the wall, will I get better guiding results? The wind tonight should be roughly the same as they were yesterday, so we'll be able to compare the results. <laughs> Scientific approach, awesome. Uh, before I get to it though, a quick reminder that if you want to help the channel help me out, you can go down below, click that like button, click the subscribe button if you're new to the channel, in which case, welcome to the channel. Leave a comment as well with maybe your struggles against the wind, and if you're feeling very generous, uh, you can join my Patreon, link in the description, as are my YouTube channel members. It really absolutely hugely helps the, the channel out. You can also buy stuff from affiliate links in the description. I will be adding Agina uh, in the list very soon as they have a lot of uh, stuff in stock that other shops don't have. Another thing you can do is buy merch like this Order of the Lazy Geek mug. Delicious. Anyway, let's get to it. Just squatting here, I can feel the wind much less. So I have high hopes, although the hood of the telescope my, might uh, make me change my mind. We'll see what the results are. Obviously, this is a terrible idea in general. Why is it a terrible idea in general? Because if you look here at the legs of my telescope, it's very low to the ground. And if I had a heavier payload here, especially especially since I don't have a counterweight, it could topple the telescope over as the telescope slews around, which would obviously be a complete disaster. <laughs> so let's hope that doesn't happen. Also, if the wind was actually super strong, it could also help topple the uh, mounts and the tripod. So not great. But because being here, the wind is actually much less and uh, I'm much mitigated by the walls of my balcony, then things should be much safer. By the way, in the past, I have used this kind of stuff <laughs> to uh, basically put poles in there and then have tarp between the poles to try to shield my equipment from the wind. But on this balcony where the winds can get really strong, <laughs> It just toppled over once and I was lucky it didn't topple the whole equipment down. So I'm not doing that anymore and now I have those uh, useless things that I have no idea how to get rid of in Tokyo because throwing stuff away here is actually super difficult. <gasps> if you have any suggestions, please let me know.
Anyway, for tonight, what I'll do is I'll do an additional polar alignment since obviously by lowering my telescope, I completely messed up the polar alignment. I'll use, as I did in a previous video, the Nina polar alignment plug plugin. And once that's done, I'll just start a sequence on that monkey head nebula and see what results we get. If you are curious about how I use Nina, I've been using it in a couple of recent videos. So I'll put links down below as well if you're, uh, if you're interested. For tonight, we're gonna skip the Nina and go straight to the results. So see you there through the magic of editing. And here we are on the results of the second night. Let's look at the PhD2 log viewer and we can see that overall it looks pretty regular. There are some spikes like this one um, and that one and this one and this one and it's very indicative of wind because uh, like if you have both declination and RA that are kind of going funky at the same time it's a good indication that it is uh, wind causing the issue. But we see that the spikes are nowhere near the intensity of last night. And this is simply because I was able using the carbon tripod to put it lower to the ground, therefore protected by walls. And therefore we have learned today that walls can block wind. Now you know. And across the night it's going really well and we have an average guiding of 0.7 arc seconds across the night. So really, this time, no problem whatsoever. And I have checked indeed that the wind was quite strong the night before. I should have had like some machine to measure the actual uh, wind speed, that kind of stuff. I didn't. Uh, but. But as a paraglider pilot, I can assure you that the wind uh, strengths were more or less the same on both nights, maybe even slightly worse on the second night, which really shows us that the AM5, at least combined with the tripod when f with its legs fully extended, is not um, very resistant to wind, but it has the flexibility of uh, of like collapsing it, collapsing it to very low height, which I see as an advantage compared to like massive uh, metal tripods that you cannot collapse to a very low kind of level, and then you can easily put it, the mount behind an obstacle that will block the wind. You want to be as close as possible to the obstacle without blocking your field of view, because otherwise you'll be in the rotor uh, of the uh, of the obstacle, which then can also wreak havoc on your on your guiding. So you want to be in the shadow of the obstacle. Now let's have a look at the results of the imaging on the monkey head nebula across two nights. I ended up with 39 frames of 10 seconds of 10 minutes long each. And I stacked them all together. I didn't even look at the uh, at the, the star shapes. I didn't bother to reject frames in advance uh, because in the uh, weighted batch pre-processing script in PixInsight, I just used like PSF signal weight, uh, which has for me been extremely ro robust as um, as a way to measure the quality of the subframes and really lowering the impact that any oblong stars in specific subframes could have. And this is our result prior to stretching. I am going to apply an auto, a linked, an unlinked, sorry, auto stretch. So control on the, and click on the item. And we can indeed see the monkey head nebula is definitely there, which is super cool. So in terms of processing, um, I'll show in this video the steps that I used to process. This is the image at first. Uh, then I did my uh, usual using uh, Adam Block's uh, processes to remove the stars with a star exterminator. Then I did an automated background extraction followed by a dynamic background extraction to really remove the background. Uh, each time I left the normalized checkbox checked and I placed back the stars with just pixel mass. Then I did some uh, photometric color calibration, then blur exterminator, noise exterminator, fairly aggressive because I had a lot of noise, followed by a rotation just so I can see the monkey head, and a mirror flip. Then I did some hyperbolic, generalized hyperbolic stretch. I still don't know what the heck I'm doing, so I don't really want to show this in this video. I'll probably do a separate video. Then another round of general hyperbolic stretch, followed by a normal histogram transformation, followed by some dynamic crop. And then I remove the stars before applying the new version, version 5 of Bill Blanchin's uh, 
uh, narrowband normalization scripts. They are awesome. Bill has just released a new video. I'll put a link down in the description. And following that, I played with the colors, selecting the yellow and uh, removing some green for it to turn it redder. Then I selected the blue and increases, increased the uh, blue and removed a bit of the red from it to make it bluer. And following that, I did a bit of curves and then another round of Blur Exterminator to really get some details. I feel a bit filthy because it's a bit, I feel like I've gone too far, but hey, you only live once. And uh, then I will, I put back the stars and this is my final image. This is the Monkey Head Nebula on two nights with two nights uh, from Tokyo uh, next to the full moon with my uh, AM5 mount, my Hyperstar C6 telescope, Rising Cam 571 uh, camera and my Antlia ALPT high speed filter. And honestly, I think it looks amazing. <laughs> It looks awesome. I really, really like this result. And that is basically it for this video. I just wanted to show like how I have to fight the wind even more than usual and how wind can be such a factor of such a big and large factor in imaging that is very easy to forget about. And so whenever you're going to image uh, in a dark zone, etc. It's always good if you're able to park the car next to your scope so you can actually, you know, uh, shield the scope from the predominant wind if there is any wind in the forecast. It's always difficult. There are tons of techniques. Obviously, having a permanent observatory, for instance, will help against wind. But uh, sometimes we just need to take it and just play with the exposures, even with oblong stars that we've gotten. And I don't know, I'm very interested in hearing what you guys, what method you use to deal with wind. Um, but and please let me know down in the comments. And with that, as always, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.